Thank you very much indeed, and uh, good afternoon and welcome to, to Master Investor, which I am delighted that uh, Fidelity is uh, sponsoring for a, for a second year. Now, some big changes uh, underway at Fidelity Personal Investing. Uh, since I stood here last year, we have launched a new flexible investment platform. It's allowing us to broaden uh, our offering uh, of investments uh, quite widely. We're no longer just a fun supermarket. Uh, you can now invest in a wide range of investment trusts, uh, ETFs, as well as the uh, uh, mutual funds that, uh, that we've been known for for many years. And of particular interest to, to many of you here, I'm sure, uh, we now also offer a growing number of individual equities as well. And the range of shares uh, on our platform will be widening progressively as, uh, as this year goes on, and we'll be adding bonds as well soon. So our aim very much is to become a one-stop shop for all your investment needs. And, um, we are well on the way to, to achieving that. So please do drop by our stand. It's numbers 30 to 32. Um, talk to me and, and my colleagues uh, about, uh, about investing with Fidelity. So what I want to do over the next 30 minutes or so is to offer you some insights into what I think is going to be a rather more challenging year than we experienced and enjoyed uh, last year. T 2017 was was very much uh, a Goldilocks year in the markets. Uh, we had pretty strong growth. Uh, we had pretty subdued inflation. We had lower for longer interest rates and an almost unnatural calm in the markets. This year, I think, will be very different. Volatility is back. We've already experienced more volatility in the first couple of months of the year than we had throughout the whole of last year. So I'm going to talk to you about six strategies uh, for dealing with that, uh, that market backdrop that I expect this year. So um, before, I, before I get on to those six strategies, though, I just wanted to take the temperature of the room to, to see how you all feel uh, about the markets uh, right now. So I've um, got some questions here about the, about the, the US market, the S&P 500. Now, it, the US market has been the leader of the pack uh, in, in the nine years or so since the financial crisis. And if the bulls remain in charge, then I expect that the, the US will continue to, to lead the charge. If the bears gain the upper hand, on the other hand, I think the relatively expensive, the relatively pricey US market will probably feel the squeeze uh, ahead of, of everyone else. So let's see if this works. If you get your, um, uh, if you get your handsets, uh, and vote on these, uh, on these four questions. So do you think that the S&P 500 is going to end 2018 more than 10% higher? So are you, are you running with the bulls? Do you, do you expect the S&P to reach 3,000 or more? Um, do you think that it will be more than 10% below where we are? We've already had a 10% correction at the beginning of February. Um, are the bears going to be back in town? Or do you think we're going to muddle along somewhere in the middle? up or down less than 10%. Less than so I can see the votes coming in. And so that's definitely more optimistic than uh, pessimistic, but it's fairly balanced, still changing. OK, very interesting. So what have we got there? 50, 65% up, 30, 35% down. Well. Very interesting. Thank you very much indeed. OK, so moving on to my six strategies then. First strategy is to do with the volatility that I expect to be a feature of the market this year. So this is, this is Peter Lynch. Peter Lynch was one of the most successful uh, investors at, at our sister company, Fidelity Investments, uh, in Boston. Um, he was a good fund manager. He was also a master of the pithy one-liner. And um, this is what he had to say about market volatility. And his point here is that staying out of the market in an attempt to avoid corrections uh, is a fool's errand. Timing the, up, the tops and the bottoms of the markets is just impossible. And worse than that, it can be extremely costly because missing out on just a handful of the best days in the market can seriously damage your long-term returns. Because you don't just miss out on the day 
in question, you miss out on the returns, on the returns that you've missed out on. Day by day, year by year, that's how compounding works. So, why will 2018 be more volatile? Well, I think it's because this is the year in which we will say goodbye to Goldilocks. Growth is likely to continue a bit, but I think the economic cycle is maturing. Interest rates are going to rise, not everywhere, not that fast, but the turn uh, has, has been reached in the cycle. Inflation uh, may look low compared to the, to, to the past, but it is coming back, and inflation has a habit of coming back very quickly when it does. So, how do you deal with that volatility that we expect? I think, first of all, Treat it as it, what it is. Treat it as an opportunity. Markets bounce back from corrections. But in order to capitalize on that, you need to have some cash to take advantage of the opportunities. So my first strategy sounds very boring, but it's very important. Have some cash to hand. And there's a second strategy for coping with volatility, and that's don't put all your money to work at the same time. Don't put it into the market just ahead of a downturn. Drip your money in month by month, slowly, regularly. And that way, not only will you buy more when the market is lower, but more importantly, you will take the emotion out of investing. You will invest when it feels most unpleasant to do so. And that, of course, is always the best time to invest. OK, so strategy two. Be alert to changing styles. Nothing stays the same for long in investment. The sands are constantly shifting underneath your feet. Now, while trying to time the market may be a mugs game, trying to preempt the shift in investment styles is very important and sensible. So for much of the period since the financial crisis, economic growth and earnings growth has been very hard to come by. And in that sluggish world, companies which have been able to offer that kind of reliable growth have commanded a premium. And that's why investors who focused on quality companies have done so well. People like Nick Train, people like Terry Smith, they've been in the right place at the right time. Now, this is Jerome Powell, Jay Powell, the new chairman of the Federal Reserve. And this is what he had to say about the current growth backdrop. He says, Growth is coming back, and it's bringing inflation with it. And one of the reasons why it's picking up is, and why we might be surprised, I think, by the pace of improvement, is that President Trump is a populist. He is looking to the midterm elections. He's looking to, to re-election. And I think that that is the thinking behind the tax cuts that we had just before Christmas. And what I fear is that those tax cuts risk pouring fuel on an already smoldering economic fire. So looser fiscal policy, all other things being equal, will lead to tighter monetary policy. So interest rates are going to rise. They're going to rise a bit more quickly than we think. So how do you invest in a higher growth, tightening interest rate environment? Well, the second strategy is to shift your investments away from those high-quality growth companies, I think, towards the more value stocks, which will do well and are dependent on the economy rising fast and firing on all cylinders. So in the jargon, it means shifting from a growth or a quality style to a value investment style. And it means backing contrarian investors, people like uh, Fidelity's Alex Wright, maybe people like Alistair Mundy at, uh, at Investec, uh, rather than the that the investors who have done so well in the last five years, as I say, people like Nick Train, people like Terry Smith. OK, now, if you're mainly invested in shares, in equities, you might wonder what bonds have got to do with your portfolio. And the answer is quite a lot. If you look back to the market wobble at the beginning of February, it was in large part due to deteriorating sentiment about the bond market. So, the day before, Jay Powell walked into the Federal Reserve for the first time. We had stronger than expected employment data, especially wage growth. And that sent inflation expectations higher. Higher inflation means higher interest rates. That, in turn, feeds through to higher bond yields. No one's quite sure what's going to happen in the bond market. This is Bill Gross. He's the so-called king of bonds. And this is what he said in a tweet in January. 
Bond yields have been falling steadily for a generation, and he thinks that the party is over. But this is not a universally held view. I was talking to my colleagues at Fidelity recently, and they have turned positive on the bond market for the first time in, in many, many months and years. And the reason, at 3% yields on Treasury bonds, there are plenty of buyers. Investors like pension funds, those with long-term liabilities to match, are very happy to lock in that kind of income. They're particularly interested in the income provided by longer-dated uh, bonds, the ones due to mature in 30 years or so. So, strategy three, I think, is to put some bonds into your portfolio, to provide some ballast for your portfolio. They behave differently from equities. They smooth your investment journey. But bonds are hard to read, so I personally would leave it to the experts. Government bonds look interesting, corporate bonds look more vulnerable. So Jupiter, Fidelity, they both have good, interesting, strategic bond funds. These are bond funds which can move around the markets and pick up the opportunities in different parts of the bond market. So leave it to the experts in the bond market. Okay, strategy four. This I would describe as the euphoria trade. Now, the bull market since 2009 has been long, but it has been lacking in conviction. No one has really believed in it. Shares have risen without investors really getting very enthusiastic. And this makes this, bond, uh, this equity bull market quite unusual. But it also provides some encouragement to me to suggest that it's not over yet. This is Sir John Templeton. He famously observed that bull markets don't die of old age. They're killed off by central banks taking away the punch bowl. And this only becomes necessary when pessimism, then skepticism, and then optimism are finally replaced by euphoria. Now, if you'd asked me this time last year whether there was any euphoria in the market, I would have said there's absolutely no sign of euphoria in the market. I think we're closer to euphoria this year than we were uh, last year. In some corners of the market, we are beginning to see irrational behavior. The sector which has driven the market up, as we know, is technology, and for good reason. Unlike during the dot-com bubble, technology stocks are delivering strong earnings growth, remarkable profits, and a rapid increase in those profits. And that's keeping valuations in the technology sector in check. But there are some real echoes of the dot-com bubble in places. Have a look at the chart of, of Netflix when you, when, you, when you get a moment. All through the end of 2016 and last year, the Netflix share price was rising at a pretty impressive rate. And then at the beginning of this year, it just turned left and started going uh, straight up the page. Now, this acceleration is typical of an investment bubble. And it feels pretty clear to me that technology is going to provide the investment bubble which finally ends this bull market. I don't think we're there yet, but that's where it's going to, going to end. Now, there are two strategies for dealing with an investment bubble at the end of a bull market. You can pull out early, you can steer clear, you can avoid the excitement, and you can avoid the pain of, uh, of the subsequent uh, collapse. Or you can ride the wave and you can hope that you will get out in time. Now, almost none of us will do that. Almost none of us will catch the top of the market. But I'm a golfer, and when you're putting, if you leave the putt short, there's one thing that you can be sure of. It's not going to go in the hole. So my strategy, my fourth strategy is putting past the hole, or the, the investment equivalent of that. I think you've got to ride the wave, but you've got to do it with your eyes absolutely wide open. This is a, this is a risky time to be investing. OK, strategy five. This is the active strategy. Now, this is the year of the dog. I suspect uh, it's the year of the dog in more ways than one. Toys R Us, Carillion, Prezzo, the list of corporate failures uh, is increasing, is getting longer. One of the consequences of super easy monetary policy is the creation of what I call a zombie uh, economy in which bad companies are kept alive much longer than they should be. 
But once the monetary tide turns, as this man, Warren Buffett, famously said, we find out who has been swimming naked. And when this begins to happen, investors tend to shoot first and ask questions later, and we're seeing that at the moment. That's why we're getting these sort of relatively sort of modest uh, profits warnings from companies absolutely being hammered by the market. Share prices are falling 30, 35 percent on any negative commentary from, from companies. And in a world of massive technological disruption, it's not just that companies are going to underperform, they're going to, they're going to slide a bit. The danger is that companies just disappear. They, they, they don't exist. And that's what investors are responding to. It's a totally new investment environment. And with this dispersion between big winners and big losers in the market, the aggregate market, I think, could well go sideways from here. Now, that actually is not a bad environment for an active stock picker. A sideways moving market can be a good opportunity to pick the winners and avoid the losers. Passive investing, on the other hand, which has become increasingly popular in recent years, and you can see why it's popular. You know, in a rising market, it's a fantastic way to capture the market's growth at low cost. But in a sideways moving market, passive investing is completely pointless. You get all the ups and downs, you get all the anxiety of a volatile market, but you don't get any of the returns. So my fifth strategy for today's market is to be active and to leave the passive funds to someone else. OK, my final uh, strategy is all about balance. And this is necessary because what this man said, uh, Jim Rogers, is both right and wrong. His observation about the best way to get rich is amusing, uh, but I think it's probably a better soundbite than an investment strategy. He's right in theory. The best way to get rich is absolutely to put all your eggs in one basket and to watch that basket really closely. But he's wrong in practice. And he's wrong in practice because picking the best stock or the best sector is only possible with the benefit of hindsight. Now, far be it from me to criticize uh, Jim. Uh, he ran the, uh, the Quantum Fund uh, with George Soros in the 1970s. He made 4,200% at a time when the US market rose by 47%. So he knows a little bit about investing. But as I say, I think this is a better soundbite than a, than a strategy. For those of us investing without a crystal ball, it's impossible to pick the winners consistently. If you rank the best and the worst performing investments in any given year, and then do it the next year and the following year, you'll see absolutely no pattern emerge. It's just, it's just chaos. And that's because it's impossible to know whether this year's winner is going to be next year's winner or next year's loser. There's no way of predicting in advance. So to get around that, you need to be extremely well diversified. And I think this is a year to be really well diversified. You need to invest in uncorrelated assets. This is, this is a year when it pays to focus on living to fight another day. This is not a year to be an investment hero. Right, so there are half a dozen themes, half a dozen strategies. How do they translate into what I'm actually investing in, where I'm putting my money? So every year at around this time, I put my head above the parapet and I say where I am investing my money. I did the same last year. If you want to see how my recommendations did last year, then you can uh, go to Fidelity's YouTube channel. There's a video there in which I uh, explain what happened uh, last year. It was quite good. Here are my picks for this year. So I've chosen these picks to fit in with those themes and strategies that I've just outlined. So the first one is Europe. I'm keen on Europe. Stephanie Butcher, uh, very good fund manager, Invesco Perpetual, Equity Income Fund, European Equity Income Fund. It's a value-focused fund. It should do well in an improving economic environment. I think with the ECB lagging the Fed in terms of monetary tightening, I think the income focus will remain attractive too. And it's defensive in what I expect to be a more volatile market. So that's my first recommendation. Ian Heslop, he uh, did a good job for my picks last year. He manages the old mutual North American fund, which did extremely well. This year, I think with 
that euphoria that I've described more in evidence in the US than in other markets. I'm tapping into his expertise in another part of the world. He also runs the old mutual uh, Asia Pacific Fund. And uh, he focuses on shifts in market sentiment and attempts to, to ride those. And, uh, and he has a very good track record. Now, I mentioned the volatility that I expect and the possibility of a sideways moving market. In that kind of market, what you want is a geographically diversified stock pickers fund. And the one that I've chosen is Jeremy Podger. He manages the Fidelity Global Special Situations Fund. He also has a great track record in the five years that he's been managing uh, that fund. And finally, my focus on diversification and balance leads me to a brand new fund that we've just launched. The Fidelity Select 50 Balance Fund, as its name suggests, it builds on our Select 50 Best Buy uh, list of preferred funds. It's designed to offer a smoother ride, it's got an asset split between bonds and between equities and a very wide geographic uh, spread to its investments. So, I want to thank you all very much for your attention today. All the funds that I've mentioned today can be found on our Select 50 Best Buy list. You can pick up the full list at our stand. It's number 30 to 32. While you're there, grab a cup of coffee, talk to my colleagues, the relationship managers there, they can talk to you, uh, they can give you some guidance on investments, they can talk about our pension cashback offer and retirement planning. They can also talk you through the new investment platform that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and don't forget also to enter our competition. Uh, we're offering a new iPad Pro. You can pick up a card, enter at the stand, and we will announce the, the winner of that uh, draw uh, at 4.30 today. So, Thank you very much indeed for your attention today and enjoy the rest of the show.